Welcome to the uh, Transportation Policy Body meeting of WAMPO. Today, March 14th, Tuesday of 2017. Uh, call the meeting to order and thank you all for being here. Uh, looks like we have enough for a quorum, so we will get started. Um, any new welcome news? Any new people? Doesn't look like, so we will move on with the meeting. Um, first item is to approve the uh, today's agenda of March 14th. Move. Thank you, Bert. Thank you, Claire. It's been moved and seconded to approve the uh, agenda for today. <clears throat> Any discussion being none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposition? Motion carries. Next item is the approval of the uh, February 14th WAMPO meeting, uh, the minutes of the WAMPO meeting. I'd make a motion to approve the February 14th minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Claire. Is there a second? Thanks. I've been a motion a second to approve the minutes. Any uh, any comments, questions? In none, uh, approval of the minutes signified by saying aye. Aye. Any opposition? Motion carries. Next item is the uh, director's report. Uh, you had on your uh, in the agenda packet the public engagement tool. And Trisha Thomas is sick today and won't uh, be providing a uh, report on that. We'll schedule that for the next meeting. Uh, next item would be the MOVE 2040 goal statements that were discussed a little bit last time, but uh, Chris Upchurch will update you on those right now. Afternoon, everyone. So you may remember I was up here last month uh, talking about performance-based planning, uh, including the aspect that the performance measures are supposed to flow out of your goals in the long-range plan. And in our long-range plan, Move 2040, they do. Uh, based on some of the discussion after that talk, uh, it seemed like there was some interest on the part of some policy body members uh, in reviewing those goals. So we thought we'd give you a brief review of those. Move 2040 has eight goals. They're in these uh, eight subject areas that you see on the screen here. For choice and connectivity, we're looking to support the connection of all modes of transportation for people and goods, including equitable access to alternative modes of transportation. For economic vitality, our goal is to support and encourage the region's economic prosperity and economic competitiveness. For freight movement, the goal is to improve the national and international freight network within the region through targeted investments and strengthen access to dom domestic and international markets. On improving air quality, the goal is to improve air quality and compliance with federal and state regulations. Under infrastructure condition, our goal is to ensure that the significant transportation infrastructure assets of the WAMPO region remain in good repair and or operation. For quality of life, uh, we're looking to enhance the quality of life through transportation investments that provide convenient access to employment, residential development, commercial activity, access to medical care, healthy transportation choices, and responsiveness to the growing diversity of household compositions. For safety, uh, we want to maintain and improve the safety of the transportation system component networks. And finally, for system reliability and bottlenecks, we want to maintain system performance and make targeted investments to provide for predictable travel time, reduce time delays, and improve safety at regional bottlenecks. So those are our eight goals out of MOVE 2040. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you have about those. I have a question about the one about the air quality and regulation. Now, we are in compliance, and I'm not aware that we have poor air quality. So is there anything specific you're looking at? Uh, not really. The, the goal, I think, here, broadly stated, is to remain in compliance with, you know, remain in attainment. And in the event we went out of attainment, because we didn't know whether we would or not at the time this goal was made, in the event we went out of attainment to do what we needed to do under the, the federal regulations there. Follow on that. Chris, wasn't there a time when it looked like we might have a challenge? Uh, yes. Um, uh, it, actually, around the time these goals were being set, we had had three fairly bad years. And if it was those three years that the federal government was looking at, we would have been out of attainment. But thankfully, since then, we had three fairly good years. And those are the ones that they're considering 
that they considered on, on whether we would be in or out of attainment. So thankfully, since this goal was made, we, our position has improved considerably. I would just say we're in compliance, so we're kind of don't have to worry about it for a little while. But I, yeah. I, as a policy body, I wouldn't want to uh, I, I wouldn't want to um, confuse compliance with federal regu regulation with air quality. Uh, I've done some research with respect to the ozone attainment. You, you could be out of attainment theoretically for about 0.37 percent of the year of the overall hours and minutes in the day. Okay, so in compliance, 99 points set some huge astronomical number, and according to the federal government, then we're out of compliance. That doesn't necessarily mean that we have poor air quality. So. Any other questions? <clears throat> okay, thank you. Thank you. Also received at your uh, chairs or your tables uh, announcement of KDOT Transportation Safety Conference to be held April 3rd through the 5th in Wichita at the downtown Hyatt. Uh, really, the target audiences will be for first responders and people involved in designing roads and, and uh, bicycle facilities and other parts of the transportation system. And some of the topics would be distracted driving, uh, safety analysis in project development, and incident management. Last thing I have is I was uh, asked to serve on a task force uh, on the federal or by the Federal Railroad Administration uh, concerning a Midwest regional rail planning study. And Kansas is one of 10 states in the Midwest included in the study that's being done uh, by the consulting firms of Parsons, Parsons Brinkerhoff and Katika. Uh, the study is being done to uh, determine possible extensions to passenger rail networks in the 10 state study area. The only representatives from MPOs on the task force are uh, from Mark in Kansas City and uh, myself from Wampo. The uh, primary uh, hub for the study is Chicago and how it links uh, connect to and from Chicago. But there were opportunities for us to uh, discuss, to add uh, new segments to the study area. And uh, I asked that they put the link from Newton to Oklahoma City on the map and showed that the adjacent uh, corporate boundary statistical area between Salina and Oklahoma City uh, was about a million people and that uh, they needed to look at that and, and perhaps add that to the study corridor. And after uh, a lot of discussion and uh, some support from the director of the Midwest uh, Regional Rail Initiative from Chicago, they did agree to add that link uh, for future study and put that uh, as one of the areas to look at. Uh, this is an 18-month assignment, and the study is to be concluded in the fall of 2018. Uh, but the, uh, there will also be a Midwest Regional Rail Planning link uh, on the FRA website, and that should be up and running in the next uh, 7 to 10 days. And the next meeting we have is uh, scheduled in June in St. Paul, Minnesota. <clears throat> kind of uh, exciting news that they did agree to add us uh, to the study corridor. So. Questions? Any questions? Okay. Next up is our uh, speaker series trends. Uh, Jason O'Brien, senior planner. Jason, welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, bring you to our next uh, installment in our speaker series. Uh, our speaker today is going to address the issue of transportation and health. Um, on the simplest level, it's important to realize that, that our transportation and land use systems affect our health. Uh, there's no such thing as a system or alternative that simply has no effect. Uh, it either helps or it hurts. Uh, there are transportation systems that encourage activity and healthy lifestyles, uh, or if not encourage, at least make them reasonably practical and safe. Uh, and there are systems that make daily physical activity uncomfortable and dangerous. Uh, to be clear, a healthy system supports active transportation, namely biking and walking. Uh, there are a few reasons why health should be something we think about as we uh, design our transportation system. Uh, a few reasons why it's not enough just to go to the doctor or join a gym. Uh, one reason is that some groups have fewer options than others. Uh, our children is one group and our elder citizens are another. Um, we'll be hearing more about the latter group when our speaker from the AARP comes to talk to you in May. 
Uh, another reason is that the obesity and diabetes problems will not be solved in the clinic, and our speaker today can tell you more about that. There's an increasing emphasis on health and transportation nationwide, uh, not only among MPOs, organizations as diverse as the Centers for Disease Control, uh, individual school districts, the Office of the Surgeon General, the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, and the American Association of Retired Persons are all taking a hard look at health and transportation. Uh, it's also very much worth noting uh, that for all the recent attention, uh, I want to draw attention to this, that this is not a new idea, uh, not at all. Uh, a healthy transportation system is just as much a traditional idea from our past. Uh, it's something we used to have. Uh, so I've been showing some pictures around as we've been talking about this in our region. Anybody recognize this place? Mayberry RFD, that's right, a beautiful little charming walkable place. Some more pictures here. A little trivia, anybody know what RFD stands for? <laughs> rural free delivery, that's right. Prior to 1919, uh, rural farmers had to go pick up their mail from the post office or a central depot. Um, here's another little shot of that. Walkable, all modes of transportation, very traditional. Um, anybody know what state Mayberry is supposed to be in? North Carolina. Okay, you're ahead of me. Our speaker today is Dr. Justin Moore. Uh, he's a board certified endocrinologist who does consulting work where clinical care and public health come together. He was medical director of Via Christi Weight Management for four years before concluding that medical weight loss does not work in the long run. Uh, his interest in public health began with the observation that the built environment is working against health and creating an uphill battle against obesity and diabetes especially. He frequently advises his patients to walk or bike to work as a practical and effective means of staying healthy. Uh, with that, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Justin Moore. Well, thank you, and I really appreciate the invitation to speak. Uh, just uh, to get started here, uh, as Jason said, I do run a consulting company in addition to my clinical practice, and one of my uh, clients here in town is Health ICT, which is represented in the room today. Uh, a few caveats about me as I talk here. I'm not an engineer. I'm not an economist. I'm not a psychologist. But I do live in the suburbs right there in northwest Wichita. I do treat people with diabetes and I do spend money, although I, I drive about an equivalent number of miles as I bike every year uh, because of some of my own uh, health problems. So as we embark on this, it's important to note that the goals of modern medicine are a little different than they used to be. Medical training and medical practice in general were designed around treating tuberculosis, right? You came to the hospital, the doctor's sick, and you hopefully left well. Uh, but we don't treat acute infectious diseases all that often anymore. About 80% of our healthcare spending is on chronic diseases. We spend $3.2 trillion per year on healthcare in this country, and obesity and diabetes together make up about a sixth of that. So, in addition to decreasing mortality, making people live longer, and making people feel better, our job in medicine has become to do that while spending less money, right? So what I want to do here is just give you a little bit of a tour of some recent very mainstream medical literature that none of your doctors would be surprised to see. This is all freely available through the National Library of Medicine, and it's just the view uh, out a doctor's window, right? So when it comes to transportation policy, there are really two areas of interest. One is simply car-related injuries, right? We've come to accept car-related injuries as a fact of life, when in fact there are about 2 million car-related injuries per year in this country and about 35,000 deaths. That's equivalent to influenza. Uh, the second is uh, the consequences of sedentary modes of transport. Now that there's all this talk of autonomous vehicles and whatnot, there's really a, a future not that far off where we could literally walk out our front door, be transported to an autonomous vehicle, be taken to the front door of our building, and be transported to our desk, right? And that's in contrast to the 18,000 calories per day that the average farmer burned uh, pre-industrially. 
So here's our tour. And as you as we go through these slides, understand how physicians approach the literature. In any study, we want to know who the population is being studied, what the intervention was, what that intervention was compared to, and what outcomes they were looking at. So in the first study, the, the population are people traveling along 10 bus routes along major urban arterials in Montreal. The intervention was bus travel. Now, they didn't randomize people. They just observed people in buses, right, and compared them to people traveling in cars with an outcome of injury rates for people in the cars or the buses and people walking along the bus paths and people cycling along the bus paths. And to make a somewhat complicated study a little simpler, here it is. So here are the outcomes. There you see the routes along the left side of the screen. And along the x-axis of, of each of these, you see the injury rates. So to get to the bottom line here, if you were in a car for every mile traveled, you were three times as likely to be injured in that car as you were in a bus. If you were walking along that bus path or adjacent to it, <clears throat> you were 22 times as likely per mile traveled to be injured by a car than you were by a bus. And if you were uh, on a bicycle, you were five times as likely to be injured by, uh, by a car than a bus. Again, controlled for numbers of miles traveled. So per, per passenger per mile, these are the numbers. So I drive a car. I'm not here to convince anyone not to, uh, but we just have to recognize that there are safer modes of transportation out there, both for pedestrians, both for cyclists, and for people in the vehicles themselves. So how does this translate to other things? I was talking about chronic disease management a couple of minutes ago. There are surprisingly few studies out there that actually directly uh, look at the impact of, of buses or trains on the health of a community. But we have a, a good one from fairly recently in Charlotte. So Charlotte installed a light rail in 2007, 2008. So it gave investigators a good opportunity to look prospectively at what happened to the population living within a couple miles of that light rail. So they did a survey uh, in 2008 prior to the introduction of the light rail system and then did a survey uh, after introduction of the light rail system looking at uh, the health status and risk factors within the community, specifically the outcomes of body mass index, that's how big you are for your height, right, activity levels, and obesity. What you see on the map, those blue dots are the randomly chosen surveyed households. The red dashed line is the light rail itself. Uh, the, the light blue line is I-77 and the, the uh, uh, yellow line is the arterial that parallels the light rail system. And here's what they found. So if you, you, again, these people were walking about a mile to get to the light rail system, right? So use of the light rail uh, to get to or from work one or more times a week was associated with a decrease in body mass index of about one point, which isn't huge. You aren't going to see any huge effect sizes in any study that I show you here, but it was highly statistically significant. So if you understand p-values, and many of you probably understand them better than I do, there was about a 98.5 percent chance of that result being real, right, and reproducible. And then the, the odds ratio of, of being obese uh, was about 20 percent lower. Again, one time per week using the light rail. So. That's all I have about public transportation because that's really about all there is recently. The data on this is fairly, uh, is fairly light uh, but evolving. When it comes to actually laying out street design and designing where streets go and what buildings go along them, we have a little more robust data stream. So this is a study looking at residents of Toronto back in 2011. And what they did was they compared people living in high density, quote unquote, walkable areas. They defined that as the number of retail destinations, schools, recreation centers within 800 meters. They don't say why they chose 800 meters, but within 800 meters of the center of, a, of the population center of a census tract, right? They compared that. To, they compared the highest two quintiles of those. So they divided all the different neighborhoods in Toronto into fifths. The top two fifths in terms of walkability and density were compared with the bottom two fifths. They left out the people right in the middle. And they looked at an outcome of who was overweight, who was obese, and who was diabetic. 
And here's what they found. It's a confusing slide, and I apologize. I'll try to walk you through it. Where you see walking and bicycling trips there, you see that as residential density goes up, there's a sharp increase in the number of walking and bike trips. But if you look at the absolute numbers, they're small, right? So the most walkie bikey people in the entire study still only did it about every third day, right? So we're not talking about, about a real sporty population here. These are people that are still walking and biking fairly infrequently. And you see that as the walkability of the neighborhood goes up, that's the blue line, uh, as, as opposed to the red line, people take more trips. It's no surprise that in those same neighborhoods, public transit uh, use goes up. Again, not huge differences. You, about, you roughly double the number of public transit trips, but you're still only traveling by public transit about every other day. And the number of automo automobile trips goes down from about 1.2 trips per day down to about 0.8 trips per day, right? So not huge effects. But what's interesting about this is that they were able to associate this with fairly positive health outcomes. There wasn't a huge relationship of weight to, uh, uh, to the density or the walkability of a neighborhood. You could, if you really squint hard for the very, very walkable places, you might be able to see a relationship there. But if you look at the likelihood of diabetes, you start to see something real. So in this country, about one out of every 10 people is diabetic. There's about 30 million diabetics in the United States. And that's a little under where they started, right? They started at about 12 per, uh, per 100 people. Uh, but if you go to the most walkable neighborhoods, that number drops down closer to eight or nine, uh, so close to a 30% reduction. Again, none of this is cause and effect necessarily. This is all observational data, so keep that in mind. But there does seem to be a clear association between walkability of neighborhoods, residential density, and how healthy we are. All right. Second study uh, in regards to this takes the original data set and expands it out to the suburbs of, uh, of southern Ontario. These are the, the Canadian cities right next to Detroit, uh, right, and, and expands it from that one year out to about uh, a decade. Looking at high walkability neighborhoods as defined now, not by the number of stores nearby, but by a validated index that goes from zero to 100, comparing them to low walkability neighborhoods and looking at the outcomes of, oh, I'm sorry, of overweight, obese, and diabetes. So here's what they found. Again, a, a kind of a, a tough slide here, but if you look at the top uh, figure, you see overweight and obesity amongst the study population. And you can see that over the study period, those stayed about the same. And for the first four quintiles, those are the non-orange bar there, for the first four quintiles, there was really fairly little difference. But once you got to that fifth quintile, the most walkable uh, neighborhoods, you started to see a real difference with the, the prevalence of overweight and obesity going from the low to mid 50s down to the low 40s. And what's interesting is if you look at the actual walkability score, remember this is a zero to 100 scale, the most walkable neighborhoods in this still weren't very walkable. Uh, they, they scored an average of 35, but that was still double the average walkability of the next group, right? So this to me lends the thought that there might be some threshold of walkability that we ought to aim for, right? You don't have to go for a perfect Stapleton, Colorado type neighborhood to make this work, right? Even getting yourself to some minimal threshold of walkability may start to make a real, uh, a real difference in metabolic outcomes. And finally, when they looked at uh, rates of diabetes within those same neighborhoods, they found the same thing, right? Really no difference in the low walkability neighborhoods, but once you hit that threshold of maybe 35 or so, you start to see a real association of, of metabolic outcomes with the walkability of the neighborhood. All right, and just to finish up that study, they found consistent things uh, as related to their previous work, showing that walking and bike trips went up public transit use went up and use of cars went down in the neighborhoods that had better that were associated with better metabolic outcomes which lends some validity to both studies since they got the same results all right how did so enough with canada right how does this apply to american cities so this study is fun because it 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 takes the same type of research out of 
uh, big metropolis places like Toronto and into places that are a little more identifiable to most of us in the room. So these investigators from the University of Connecticut looked at these 24 medium-sized California cities, all between 30 and 100,000 people, and looked at high intersection density neighborhoods. That's inter neighborhoods with a lot of streets crossing, right? A lot of streets connecting, and a lot of streets that were grid-like. So the older parts of town, in other words, right, when we still laid out streets north and south, east and west. They compared those to lower intersection density places with lower connectivity and tree-like street networks. So think the newer parts of town, the cul-de-sacs, right, and, uh, and compared rates of obesity, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and asthma. And they found nothing with asthma. Uh, but what they found uh, was that, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. I forgot I'd put this slide in there. Just to prove to everyone that engineers can quantify anything, uh, right? So this is, the, this is the civil engineering sort of approved rubric for looking at streets, uh, where we compare grid-like to tree-like and then linear uh, to tree to grid-like on this X and Y uh, Cartesian plot, right? So what they're ultimately comparing in this study is the grid grid in the, in the lower right of the screen with the linear tree, the kind of ultimate cul-de-sac neighborhood in the upper left side of the screen, which I like to think of as kind of the neighborhood fingerprint, right? <laughs> and if you look at my neighborhood, which is probably invisible to the room, I'd say mine most resembles the, the radial grid there kind of in the lower middle of the screen. But here's what they found. So when, it look, when you go look just at intersection density, how many streets crossed within one square mile, and you go from 81 intersections per square mile up to 324 intersections per square mile, there's a surprisingly linear drop in the rates of obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and coronary artery disease. And at least for obesity in this study, it was a fairly powerful drop, right? Now understand, People weren't randomized. They controlled for things like sex, age, race, uh, income level, et cetera. Uh, but this is, this is observational regress data, right? But still, if, if, the, if the finding of this study is to be believed, more intersection density, at least up to some point, is associated with better, with better health outcomes. The second thing they did was they looked at the link to node ratio. And I know that there are probably people in this room, Jason among them, that can tell you all about the link to node ratio. All it is is a ratio between the number of streets and the number of intersections. So if you look at example A at the bottom of the screen, that link to node ratio is 0.88 because there are seven streets with eight nodes, right? However, if you were to connect the streets at the top, the cul-de-sacs at the top and the bottom of that street layout, you would have a higher link to node ratio of 1.13, 9 over 8. So a perfect grid is 2.5, right? And none of the neighborhoods in this study met 2.5. The highest they got was 2.25. But you can see that as the link to node ratio goes up, more interconnected streets, rates of obesity tend to go down, rates of heart disease tend to go down. Not a huge effect, but remember, this is amplified over hundreds of thousands of people uh, to where the number of people affected ultimately is pretty large. And then the, fun, the most fun part of this study was when they actually looked at the street layouts themselves. And without belaboring the fact, they found that the best metabolic outcomes were associated with the grid-like street layouts, the lowest rates of obesity, hypertension, and heart disease. Interestingly, the neighborhood, the, the radial grid pattern like I think I live in was about the worst, even worse than the cul-de-sac neighborhood. All right. So that's a quick overview of the literature on this, but it's, it's always risky to, to uh, depend on individual studies. The best literature in most of medicine comes from systematic reviews, so that's what this is. So this was a, a systematic review of 30 studies looking at public policy interventions, comparing active and motorized transport, and seeing how they affected the environment or health in the cities in which they were implemented. And I'll cut right to the chase. You can see that most well thought out uh, policy changes to try to influence the rates of active transport have overwhelmingly positive effects. The one outlier in this study though, I think is worth pointing out, this was in Copenhagen where they had a public uh, 
uh, campaign to try to get people to replace half of their trips under two, under 10 kilometers, so whatever that is, 12 miles, and a third of their trips under 15 kilometers with bicycle uh, use. And what they found was that they had a, this was when Copenhagen was undergoing its transformation from a car predominant city to now a bicycle predominant city. There are more bikes than, than cars in, in daily use on the roads in Copenhagen now. They found that they unsurprisingly had this huge increase in traffic accidents, uh, right? They, they weren't fatal, they didn't even all result in injuries, but they were there and somebody had to come and attend to it and that's what they found. And you'll also consistently find that people that, uh, under, that, that choose to use active transportation in studies like this are exposed to more air pollution, right? Uh, uh, so that is one of the negatives as cities undergo this transformation. But I suspect what you guys are most interested in is the, the dollars and cents of this. There's always a humanistic argument to these things on top of a dollars and cents argument. The two cities, ironically, in America that have the best research uh, in terms of active transport are Minneapolis and Portland, which are intuitively horrible places to walk or bike, right? It's cold and snows five feet a year in Minneapolis and it rains 100 days a year in Portland. Uh, but in spite of that, they have a lot of data behind their efforts. So in Portland, they have a, an ongoing budget that projects out a $605 million uh, local investment in pedestrian and bike infrastructure by 2040. And they're far enough in this that they've been able to track some local health outcomes. And what if they extrapolate their current findings into... Uh, 20-year outcomes by 2040, they project a savings of $594 million. So the, the investment itself uh, was essentially a wash. They, they've put about as much money into it as they expect to get out in direct health care costs. But interestingly, if you use the insurance actuarial number for what one year of human life is worth, which is $50,000, that's based on dialysis, right? It costs about $50,000 for us to dialyze someone for a year once their kidneys fail. So that's what the insurance people use as the value of one human life for a year. The value in life saved, life saved is seven to $12 billion. So $7 billion would equal 14,000 people in Portland living 10 years longer each as a result of this uh, as a result of these interventions. That's, that's where the number comes from. So the authors of this study, at least, calculated that the benefit to cost ratio in Portland, which is its own ecosystem, uh, is probably about three to one. So conclusions. I think I'm wrapping up actually fairly close to time here. So the transition away from car-based transportation and the city design that goes along with it and toward a little more concentrated, a little more active transport-oriented city is associated with clear improvements in, uh, in health outcomes and, uh, if you count the value of human life at least, decreased healthcare expenditures. Uh, understand the effect size tends to be small and there aren't randomized trials to back this up. All we have at this, well there are actually, there are a few, but I didn't, they're old and I didn't include them. We we're relying mostly on, uh, on observational data. But I think a very reasonable case can be made that as new things are built in the city, as the built environment progresses, there are a couple ways to do it. And there, there's one way that's associated with better health outcomes, like Jason said, and there's, there are other ways that are associated with worse. Uh, and that's the decision that's up to you guys, I guess. So I think that's all I have. There's my email address. There's the address of Health ICT, where, which is where I work here in town. And uh, you can also find me at doubleairmetabolism.com if need be. So I'll stop talking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Moore. That was uh, quite a bit of information. I learned some new terms. You have walkie and bikey people. <laughs> so like I, uh, people I, also. I, I'm more of a uh, walkie bikey. You'll find hikey bikey people <laughs> okay. out there, too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anyway, <clears throat> any observations, questions? I'll make one. At the, at the beginning, it's when I go for my, uh, my physical, the doctor at the end, and I'm, I'm healthy right now, at least have been, and 
he always says, well, make sure you wear your seatbelt. I'm going, really? And he goes, oh, I got, he said, well, he has more health people that are just fine that end up not being healthy because they don't wear their seatbelt and they have an accident. So. Yeah, that, that one of the hidden secrets in, in public health is how little you actually have to move the needle to save money, right? So, you know, a, a single myocardial infarction costs, say, Medicare, you know, tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars. So you don't have to prevent too many of them to save a lot of money. It's the strangest thing. All right. Fascinating. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I made an error earlier <laughs> on the agenda. I skipped over item number three, which is public comments. Uh, so does anybody from the public want to speak on this or address the policy body? Okay, being none, we'll move on to the committee and status reports and updates. Uh, first one, Kristen, is that you? You up first? Certification review follow-up. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Kristen Zimmerman here on WAMPO staff, and um, I'm here to uh, just introduce our certification review update today. So many of you probably recall that the Federal Highway Administration and the Federal Transit Administration uh, carry out uh, these reviews uh, every, every four years to large MPOs all across the country. These reviews are called certification reviews, and the most recent one that we did here at WAMPO was uh, just a couple years ago back in 2015. So the purpose of these reviews is to certify that MPOs are meeting the, the basic uh, federal requirements for MPOs and also to promote the best planning practices. So as you'll probably recall, our review resulted in similar findings as the review we had back, the previous one, back in 2011. And that included two commendations, two, two things we were doing great on, seven recommendations, so seven things that we should keep in mind and, and uh, do a little better on, and one corrective action. That was, that was one thing we, we had to change. So the primary issues uh, with this review were focused on how WAMPO carries out the transportation planning process and also the relationship between the, the three uh, partners involved in carrying out transportation planning in our region. That's us here at WAMPO, our uh, partners at KDOT, the Kansas Department of Transportation, and our partners at Wichita Transit. Uh, the specific planning issues had to do with how our long-range plan, the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, our short-range plan, the TIP, the Transportation Improvement Program, and uh, another process called the Congestion Management Process, how they're designed, executed, documented, and appropriately interrelated. So as you probably recall, our federal partners presented the results to you uh, back in the fall of 2015, and we are here today to just give you an update on where things stand with our follow-up on that. So I'm very happy to report that our staff met with uh, our federal partners as well as our partners from KDOT and Wichita Transit on uh, nearly a monthly basis uh, since that time, since the fall of 2015. And I'm even happier to report that uh, a lot of progress has been made during that time. Uh, we've initiated work on all seven recommendations and the one corrective action. And to date, four of the recommendations are resolved and there's been uh, tremendous work on the corrective action. And the balance of the recommendations are still uh, under consideration or will be incorporated in the next update to our long-range plan. So before I turn it over to uh, our federal partners, Paul Fondukas and Daniel Wynn, I just want to, uh, and they'll brief you on the details of all the, 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 the commendations, the corrective action, and our recommendation, and their, their update on their sense of our status. I just wanted to take some time to thank the folks that have been involved in the follow-up that we've been doing. So uh, we've had a great group to work with. Uh, it included Renee Hart and Corey Davis with KDOT. Uh, we worked with Michelle Strute and Philip Ziebenbergen at Wichita Transit. And uh, our staff uh, also did a tremendous amount. So I want to thank you and appreciate you guys being here in attendance in person today. And of course, I want to thank our federal partners, Paul Fondukas and Daniel Wynn. Uh, it's fairly unusual to have such a focused follow-up to these sorts of things of meeting monthly and uh, checking in that frequently, but uh, I think it resulted in some really good outcomes, and 
Uh, it, it did, I'm, I'm sure we could all agree, it did get sort of contentious at times, uh, but uh, we're, we feel good that we're at a good place now. Uh, we've got most of this wrapped up and uh, we've successfully come out on the other side. So uh, let me turn it over to Paul and Daniel and they'll update you on their, their sense of where things are. I, uh, I don't know what Kirsten was talking about. It never gets contentious, never. <laughs> um, so hello, everybody. I'm going to kind of give you guys a, a status update on where we are in the certification review findings. I'll, I'll try to keep it short. Um, uh, the first topic we'll talk about is uh, cooperative partnerships in the planning process. We would made uh, one commendation. Uh, in this regard, about your recent reorganization efforts at that time. Uh, you had recently expanded your attack to, to include a lot of other stakeholders, and we were very mm -hmm. impressed with that. Um, folks like freight and stuff were finally at the table, and that's something unusual and something that's really seen as a best practice. We were also really impressed with the guy mechanism that you guys developed for generating cash match, uh, that tip fee and the was something kind of novel. We'd never really seen it before, and it seems to be working very successfully for you guys. So that was another best practice that we stole from you, and we're, we're kind of sharing it with uh, all the other MPOs. Um, we made three recommendations, the first of which was for the TPB to be uh, expanded to include a representative from Wichita Transit, and that's a, a standing recommendation. The second was to update the partnership agreement between WAMPO, KDOT, and Wichita Transit uh, to more clearly define the roles, responsibilities, and expectations for each of the partner agencies. In the oh, we, are you all right if we interrupt you for some questions? Uh, absolutely. OK. I just Jen. need a definition here. A standing recommendation, is that a euphemism for we haven't done it yet and still need to? Uh, OK, in that case, it's simply a recommendation that we'll continue to be making. Um, you may, we haven't like, done it. Well, in this particular one, you may choose to act on it. You ultimately may choose not to. Uh, the federal partners still feel like this is a worthwhile recommendation, and so we'll keep making it. Thank you. Is that helpful? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Oh, anytime. Uh, yeah, and feel free to interrupt or ask questions kind of as I go along, uh, just in case I'm going too fast or I gl gloss over something that you don't understand. Um, okay, going back to the partnership agreement, um, historically there's been some problems, particularly in the long-range planning between the three organizations. We still have these stovepipes and these, you know, the, the state and the, the transit operator and the local municipalities are all doing their transportation planning in their own little realms. And WAMPO is really supposed to be the venue where they get together and harmonize a lot of that activities. And, and we still struggle with that here. Um, and you're not the only one. A lot of MPOs have that same struggle. Uh, but we felt like updating that partnership agreement might be a step in the right direction to try to do a better job of breaking down those walls and getting uh, that cooperative planning process to work a little bit better, especially as we have these new performance management requirements coming out too. There's the potential for conflict about who's going to collect what data and share it with whom, when is that going to be due. So if we can get ahead of the game and articulate who will do what, when, and where before those requirements are really upon us, I think that might head off some, some potential conflict. Um, the third recommendation was about uh, providing more deliberate attention to regional transportation planning, particularly in our core documents, the Long Range Plan and the TIP, We've historically given an inordinate amount of attention to those suballocated funds, and that's, it was kind of inappropriate. And we, we gave you guys that question to consider. You know, if those suballocated funds disappeared tomorrow, would you guys still have a complete plan or a complete tip? Um, most MPOs don't actually receive those funds, and yet we still have to develop that regional transportation plan and that regional improvement program. Um, another question. So oh, the year that we spent talking about and working on that for you means it's still a standing recommendation. You don't even consider the work that we did as a work in progress? Oh, no, I, I apologize. Um, no, we, we do recognize the progress we've made. Um, 
I think what we're really eyeballing is the next MTP update. We're, we're going to call it a standing recommendation and then take a step back after the next long-range plan update to kind of, again, reevaluate whether or not we've gotten to where we need to be. Um, but don't let that belittle the fact that we have, in fact, made a lot of progress. We're having the right kinds of conversations. So we are definitely headed in the right direction. Move on to uh, administration and finances. Um, in the last review report, we, we congratulated you guys for the uh, improvements you had made to your unified planning work program uh, since the 2011 certification review. You guys had made a lot of improvements that we are very happy about. And in fact, your, your UPWP wound up becoming a model that we used for all the other MPOs in the states. We were so pleased with it. Um, but we still had some lingering concerns during this review about uh, the use of consultants and staffing levels. And in particular, we were very concerned with uh, frequent staff turnover, which had historically been a problem, at least for the last decade or so. We felt like it was really interfering with the ability of the MPO to be successful and to produce good work products. Uh, so we suggested that you guys do a, a comprehensive review of your organization and staffing structure. Uh, when Phil came on in 2015, I think that was one of the things kind of high on his radar, and he really started to tackle this effort. Um, I know he reached out to some former employees and such and tried to find out, you know, why they leave the organization, what kind of problems existed. And since then, he has uh, revamped uh, some of the staffing structure here. He's uh, tried to realign job titles with people's skill sets and qualifications. I know there's been some uh, some salary fixes to try to make things a bit more competitive and comparable to what other MPOs are paying. Um, so we consider this recommendation resolved. We think a lot of excellent progress has been made. Um, for the first time in probably a very long time, we really see a lot of enthusiasm here at the MPO to, to try to make the organization more relevant, more successful, more productive. And we see that. We recognize that. We want to we wanna celebrate that and congratulate you guys on it. So uh, as far as we're concerned, this particular issue is, is resolved. Because they have a new office? Is that why they're all excited? Absolutely. We do appreciate not having to go through security anymore. So, uh, Public involvement. Uh, we recommended that you guys update your public participation plan to better reflect the requirements. Uh, and before I get ahead of myself, um, we also, at the same time, commended you guys for your very successful public outreach activities during your last MTP update. That was one of the areas where you guys really shined. We thought you did an amazing job. And so with this topical area, it's not so much that you're not meeting the intent of the requirements. We absolutely think you are. In fact, you're probably going above and beyond. You're doing wonderful. Uh, this was just some documentation issues in our PPP. The regulation said the PPP had to include X, Y, and Z, and we only had X and Y. Uh, so we knew this would be a relatively easy fix, relatively painful, and sure enough, you, your staff got on it, made a, improvements to the PPP. You improved it last year or earlier this year, uh, and we consider this issue to be resolved. Moving on to the tip, uh, we recommended that certain content and format improvements be made to your tip, uh, particularly with the, the project listings, which for a very long time were, were difficult to uh, digest and understand and read. Um, the financial analysis needed some improvement, the EJ analysis. Um, the sub-allocated funds, there was that um, inappropriate level of focus being given to them, as we mentioned before. Uh, discussion of major projects. Uh, n none of these, I think, were news. We've been kind of rattling off these kinds of recommended improvements for a long time. Uh, staff, over the last year and a half, two years, something like that, has been working hard to make a lot of these improvements. Um, Project listings, um, kind of going back to the, the project tracker tool that's been developed. Those are kind of serving now as the new project listings or the, the source for the new project listings. Uh, I don't know if you guys have compared your old tip to the new tip, the 2017 one, but 
it's much improved in that regard. It's much more readable. The information that we need to do our jobs is much more accessible. Um, I would say for the most part, these, these issues are resolved. Um, as with any kind of living document, uh, we'll probably make some small improvements and tweaks over the years as we refine our process. But uh, from the certification review standpoint, we would consider this issue resolved. Your staff made a great effort to cooperatively with us and with the other planning partners to, to get this issue resolved in a timely fashion. Uh, the other recommendation related to the TIP is about improving the self-certification process. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but every time you approve a new TIP, you, uh, you sign off on a self-certification, saying, yes, we're doing X, Y, Z. Um, most policy boards don't even know what they're signing most of the times. And that's really what this recommendation is geared toward. Um, moving forward, we would love to see staff provide you guys some kind of documentation or presentation when you guys approve the TIP to give you a better sense of what it is you're signing off on. Uh, it's not a high priority, and to be honest, your staff over the last couple of years has probably been a little overwhelmed. We've thrown a lot at them, and they've had a lot to do. So we want to recognize that there are limitations to how much that they can accomplish. So we're kind of putting this one on the back burner. It's something we'll shelve until maybe there's some downtime, and then we can snag this low-hanging fruit and kind of get to work on it. Moving on, uh, MTP. So our, our MT, last MTP update uh, had some issues. We made several recommendations. Um, some of the issues that we had with the last MTP really had to do with kind of documenting our, our needs assessment and uh, evaluating potential strategies. Given the amount of resources that we were spending on it, we really expected a lot more technical analysis being done in that last MTP, and it just, it just wasn't there. And then when you kind of look at the, the document as a whole, it doesn't really rationally relate what you guys would say was your goals to the actual project listings. Uh, the actual project listings themselves were very difficult to digest because there was two or three of them, and they had uh, different projects on them. Uh, and then similarly, the financial analysis was difficult to comprehend because you couldn't compare it to any one particular project list. So we, we made uh, a litany of recommendations within a certification review. I didn't list them all here. Um, but uh, we have been working to fix these issues. Your staff has been hard at work. You guys approved an amendment to the long range plan back in like October or November, which fixed a lot of the technical issues. Uh, the new financial analysis that you guys included in that uh, uh, appendix was much improved, much readable, much more readable and comprehensible. The new EJ analysis that you guys included was much more insightful. The maps you added for the environmental section was, again, more insightful. Uh, the project listings I don't think is quite done yet just because we were waiting for the project tracker tool to kind of get finished, but that's something that's going to happen relatively soon. Um, so, as far as we're concerned, the technical issues have been resolved. The process-oriented issues are really going to be fixed during the next MTP update. And that's really about kind of rationally relating your goals and objectives to the project that you're uh, implementing and uh, making sure that your needs assessment is really backed up by some technical analysis, some useful information. All right, last one, CMP, your favorite subject. Uh, so we provided a corrective action regarding the congestion management process about developing a functional CMP that uh, assesses the causes and the extent of congestion in the region and evaluates strategies and monitors the effectiveness of whatever strategies you chose to implement. This has been a long-standing concern, a couple of corrective actions and recommendations and prior reviews. Um, and so, at least uh, from our concern, we didn't really have a, a choice but to issue a corrective action on this. Um, looking back, the, the key issue had always been staff turnover. Um, the person responsible for implementing this kind of turned over with some level of frequency. There was never really a sense of ownership from anyone in the staff to kind of champion this issue. And uh, we needed to find a way to uh, resolve that. 
um, we do have to kind of accept that this is a requirement, even though we do recognize that congestion management may not be a high priority for you, uh, especially since we don't have systemic gridlock in this region. Um, but again, it is a requirement, and, and we are implementing congestion management strategies, even though some of us may not think that they are. You know, when we're resolving a bottleneck at an interchange or we're implementing ITS improvements, those are congestion management strategies. And presumably those are being implemented because there is some traveler concern with congestion. Now, it's not the gridlock kind of congestion you're going to see in a, a New York or Chicago. It's that non-recurring um, irregular congestion that might be caused by a bottleneck at an interchange or poor weather or a special event or a traffic accident. Uh, those are the kinds of congestion issues that we have in this area. Um, staff has been working to resolve this issue. We feel like everybody's been working in, in good faith. Uh, we finally feel like we're getting a lot of traction on this issue where we haven't before. So we're very excited to see that we have some momentum going. As part of your MTP amendment that you adopted late last year, uh, we included uh, some information on the CMP. Staff. Uh, worked with the committees, developed some performance measures, operationalized them. They conducted a baseline assessment of congestion in the region. Um, but uh, I, work isn't quite complete. When we looked at that analysis, we found that that analysis showed that we have no congestion in the region. And it's problematic because we're implementing these congestion management strategies. So we're in a bit of a bind where we've come and hit a wall. So what do we do? Uh, we've put our heads together and came up with some, some next steps, which will they be successful? We don't know yet. We kind of have to do some investigating. But over the next couple of months, this is kind of what we're looking to do. Uh, KDOT is going to go back and uh, dig out some, uh, some of the technical analysis, some of the supporting documentation for some of the projects that we've been impl implementing in the region, those, uh, those interchange improvements, the ITS improvements, to see what kind of metrics or analysis were used to help justify those improvements. And your staff is going to work on doing a safety analysis for the region to see if, if we try to look for high accident locations, are those the same spots where we're implementing the, these projects? Can that help connect the dots for us? Um, so we'll probably be getting together sometime in the next couple of months to kind of see where those investigations take us, and we'll probably come back to you sometime shortly thereafter to give you guys a, an update on that. Um, and that's it. Um, like Kristen said, we've made a, a lot of progress. Uh, we've already knocked out four of these recommendations. They're considered to be resolved. We have some of these more process-oriented ones about um, you know, building that partnership agreement so that we avoid conflict and confrontation in the future and uh, making sure that we, we do right uh, during the next MTP update. Um, and we still have some work to do on the CMP. But uh, otherwise, you guys should take a lot of pride in your staff. They've done a lot of great work. We should celebrate that, the improvements that uh, you as an organization have been making. Um, we are here as a resource for you whenever you need us. We will try to get out of your way as much as possible. Uh, we think you guys are really starting to blossom. You're starting to shine. And uh, we don't, we don't want to get it in the way of that. So I guess I'll open it up to any questions, concerns. I'll also open it up to staff to correct me if I got anything wrong. <laughs> or to let me know if I missed anything important. Paul, thanks for the summary. We do have a couple of questions. Bert, first. Paul, I, great report out. I guess my concern remains from when we did the initial report out a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago. If we're having a certification review against standards, what we had talked about back then is for the recommendations or corrective action that there'd be a reference in the authority that says it must be done this way, paragraph, page, whatever that says, here's what, the, here's what it says you must do, and here's what you're not doing, so that would warrant a recommendation, or here's what you're really not doing, so this warrants a corrective action. And I don't dispute anything that you're doing of the work, but I think it would still be helpful for us as a board to understand you know, to, to Janet's point, if it's a recommendation 
and you say, okay, it's kind of up to you to do it or not do it, then once you've made us aware of that, but if you keep re-recommending it, is there something in the standards that it, your opinion is, could this recommendation, if it's never acted on, you finally say, okay, that needs to become a corrective action. It's our view, we've recommended and recommended. So I guess the, the point I'm trying to make is, each one of these commendations, recommendations, or corrective action should point to a specific paragraph in a document that it's our charter that says these things must be done. I understand it's kind of subjective, but that's what I would like to see in each one of these is what is the reference to the standard that you base your recommendation, corrective action, or whatever on so that is documented. And if anyone says, okay, what are you really challenging? I'd like to personally, and maybe I'm just this way, I'd like to go to paragraph B3C that says, you will do this as part of your charter, and it clearly says in the recommendation or corrective action that you wrote, we're not doing that. And so then anyone who's working on this, their objective is to comply with the standard as written or change the standard. So. No, that, that's a good point. And if that's something you guys still want, that's actually a relatively simple exercise on our part to go back and do if you'd like it, like us to. We could provide you a little summary sheet of all the recommendations and the corrective action and then yank out the, the regulatory language that kind of goes along with it. Um, for most of them, I should say. Um, there was kind of a practice that me and Daniel do, and every division and regional office of your federal partners does this a little differently. But we generally don't like to throw corrective action out too often. And so a lot of times if we find a, um, something wrong, you know, from a regulation standpoint, we'll throw it at you as a recommendation first to see if you guys will, in good faith, make the correction so that we don't have to throw that scary word out there, you know, corrective action. And we only usually do that, we usually only throw a corrective action if it's a long-standing concern that we're not making progress on. But it does get confusing because some of the recommendations are not based in regulation. Uh, a good example of that, whoops, there we go, w would be this one. You know, th there is no regulation that says conduct a comprehensive review of the organization, right? This is just something that based on our observations and the struggles that we've had over the last decade, 15 years, you know, with staff toning over that we're saying, hey, we, we would recommend that you guys really kind of take a hard look at this. It's, it's a recommendation. If you chose not to do it, there's no ramifications. We just think it's a good idea. Um, of all of them, this might be the only one that's like that. Come look at it. Um, yeah, all the, all the other ones would be based uh, on a regulation that we could point to and we could list out on a piece of paper or a, maybe front and back for you guys if you'd like that. Yes, uh, another one of the recommendations is the expansion of your policy body that we've listed right there. This is that we have as a standing recommendation. That is not in any of the regulatory requirements, but due to the fact of the NPO being a multimodal or entity, that's what we would like to do is to expand your horizon, to think not just roads and bridges, but also transit and how other modes affect you as a region. So when we're talking about a standing recommendations, you're not required to have transit at your policy body to have full voting rights, but that's one of the recommendations as us as FTA would like for you to have However you guys deal with that, that's fine, but that's just one of ours where we would like to see a more multimodal philosophy within your organizations. And so then when you actually do make decisions for the future, it's not just in the silos, it just says, hey, only the roads and bridges gets all the funding. So that's a multimodal issue that we have encompassed with other MPOs because traditionally roads and bridges has always been the dominant player. But as you've noticed now more and more, you're getting to these other multimodes and how, they're, how important they are within the health of the region and also within the infrastructure. I wouldn't disagree with the recommendation. One thing I'm saying is 
if the standards are set that says we probably ought to have the board yeah. or our relationships expanded, then the standards ought to be stated that way. Then we either are or are not doing it. I just think you get into, for all the, when you throw a certification process out, then whether it's a corrective action, but ultimately the certification process is we're complying with the, the guidelines that's been given to have this organization. And as recommendations come up, or as corrective action, whatever the level of that is, I personally feel that should be pointed to something in that document that says this is required. If not, certainly, you know, I think we should do lots of things, or you think we should do lots of things that could be part of your side conversation, but should it be captured in the official report as a recommendation and as these show, and then tracked? Is my point. Yeah, I, I think what we can do then is, as the follow-up, is to identify which one of the federal regs that you guys need to do. And when we start talking about recommendations, identify the differences so that way it has you guys identify, has an understanding with you guys so that if you guys don't make these recommendations, there's no fault. And an idea just occurred to me, and moving forward, maybe in future cert reviews that we do with the MPOs, maybe come up with a different terminology. You know, we'll have the corrective action for those long-standing issues. And maybe we, we define a difference between a recommendation and a suggestion or something like that. And we say a recommendation is based on regulation, whereas a suggestion is simply a best practice that we're sharing. Um, maybe something like that would be more useful moving forward, um, just so that there is no confusion about what are the must-dos and what are the wouldn't it be nice kind of uh, suggestions. Okay. Thanks, Bert. Tom, did you have a question? Okay. Well, I, I think it's worth noting that <clears throat> I think you made reference to fall of 15, which is a lot of the members of this policy body were not around, especially when you refer to the last 10 years. And uh, the last few years, we knew it was, we had some chores to do and, and some work to get. But I want to thank Tom and I think Janet, Dan, and the others, members at the time that really helped work through this. If I'm missing somebody, I'm sorry, but but uh, it does sound like a much more positive report than we we had a, a 18 months ago. <laughs> Go I will make my comment. I was going to not do it, but of all the briefings that we've had with these two gentlemen, this is probably the most positive one we've had. Uh, and I, I don't mean that. I want to sound correct. I mean, staff has done some things over the last couple of years that have fixed some broken pieces and our rapport is better with you now. So, yeah, like we instead of just saying no, we try to work on stuff. Okay. The, the relationships are definitely much, much more improved. If you were to just turn the clock back five years, things were almost at a standstill and you fast forward to where they are now. Uh, much more productive relationships between all the organizations. And we really do feel like you guys are starting to really shine, starting to really blossom as an organization. Um, we're very excited about where you guys are probably going to wind up. We feel like uh, we should be celebrating a lot of the successes. You know, we do have some room for improvement, things we got to work on, but, you know, don't don't let that baggage kind of hold us down. I think we can get through that. We'll fix these things, and you guys can keep plowing forward. Um, we're, we're very optimistic at this point, probably more optimistic than we've been in very, very long time. So. OK. It really wasn't that gloom very long time. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? OK. Paul, and thank you for your thank time. You, Daniel. All right, appreciate it. Okay, moving on to uh, K. Dot Headquarters, Mr. Moriarty. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chair. Uh, with your permission, I'll give an update from headquarters and the Wichita Metro office as well. I believe uh, Tom could not be here today. Uh, first out of headquarters, want to let everybody know that K. Dot is monitoring the Trump administration's uh, proposed infrastructure package. Uh, what we're hearing at this time, uh, President Trump is looking towards uh, sort of a streamlined uh, national plan. Uh, he wants to emphasize the renovation of existing infrastructure over construction of new facilities. 
And the president wants to place a priority on projects that are ready to, to move quickly to con construction. Uh, we did take a look at a Wall Street Journal report that indicated um, states receiving any of his dollars uh, would potentially need to move towards construction within 90 days of receiving those funds. So that's a pretty quick turnaround. Um, a little bit on dollars and timing. Uh, during his joint, joint session of Congress last week, he did call for a $1 trillion uh, national infrastructure package. And he also said that he would begin to address that plan after lawmakers tackle uh, health care and tax reform. Uh, so again, one, one of his top three uh, priorities at this time. Uh, many of you are aware the National Go Governors uh, Association did submit uh, nearly 300 projects to the, the administration in early February for consideration under his package. Uh, there were five projects that came out of Kansas. Uh, phase two of the John Redmond Reservoir dredging was one of them, uh, as well as some stream bank stabilization projects above federal reservoirs. Uh, there were also three highway projects that came out of Kansas, one of which was I-235 here in Sedgwick County up at the Northeast Junction. Uh, the Lewis and Clark Viaduct on I-70, which connects Kansas to Missouri. And then there were two I-70 projects that were combined into one project out in Thomas and Gov counties. And again, these were submitted uh, by the NGA in response to the administration's own list of 50 projects that they had submitted to the NGA, if that makes sense. Um, and none of those 50 that came out of the Trump administration were here in Kansas. And that's what I know right now. So long story short, uh, we are continuing to mo mo monitor this ongoing conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. That's thanks for the quick reaction. I think the North Junction is something that it's going to take us a long time to complete without a shot in the arm or a shot of adrenaline from the Fed, federal world. So, um, and I also want to thank I think uh, Sedgwick County Commissioners uh, Dave Unruh and oh, and you were in Washington and helped. Do you want to report on any of that, David? Talked to uh, both Senators uh, Roberts and Senator Moran about uh, the uh, North Junction and, and uh, were both uh, supportive. Of course, uh, one thing they pointed out was the money will come down to Kansas uh, and we have to make sure that uh, we're there to uh, uh, make sure that it comes our direction. Okay. Very good. Anything else, Mike? Oh, locally, yeah. Uh, just a brief report on behalf of Tom, uh, Tom Hine. Uh, so we found out a week or two ago that Benny Traverti had announced his retirement from KDOT. Benny was our District 5 engineer. His area was South Central Kansas. He's based out of Hutch. Uh, so he retired. His last day was Friday. Uh, Monday morning, bright and early, Brent Tierstrip was named the new District 5 engineer. Many of you may know Brent. I believe he sat on this body for a period of time maybe two, three years ago, something like that. So Brett's a great guy, great KDOT guy, great to work with, and we're very excited to hear he's moved up to the role of district engineer. Okay. The um, next uh, in on your agenda is uh, Rick Backlund, uh, but he is not here, so we will pass on that. And then the FTA, uh, Mokti Ahmad is here, no? He's not here either. Okay. Wichita Transit, Mr. Steve Spade, are you available? Yep. I am, thank you. Um, I'd like to bring you up to date on a couple uh, projects we've got going on. The first is our transit enhancement project, and this uh, is a project that encompasses uh, the next step in reinventing the transit system and starting to make it more effective, but also uh, the uh, use of the Hyatt funds that were contributed to transit by the city. Uh, two things we're working on right now. One is uh, focusing on taking the next step in our fixed round improvements, and then we follow up with that uh, on working on the development of alternative transportation services. As it, we look at our fixed rod improvements, one of the, th the things we're recommending is that we bring the entire system up to 30-minute uh, peak hour service. Right now, uh, four out of five out of 17 routes are operating less than 30-minute service during the rush hour. 
So under this plan, we would bring those services up to 30-minute peak hour service, and then we'd have an adequate level of service that we think uh, uh, can adequately serve uh, work trips in the community uh, during the peak hour. During the midday, uh, where we're running less than 30-minute service, more like 60-minute service on these routes, we want to make sure that we're providing adequate connections with folks uh, with a service called universal transfers, where uh, transfers are made, uh, made uh, much easier. Our plan is to implement those uh, improvements uh, in August of this year. And as we start looking at alternative transportation, we want to make sure that we've got the base system in place. Uh, the next step then is that we'll start looking at alternative transportation options. And uh, what the alternative transportation options are meant to do is take a look at applications where uh, the large bus or the fixed route isn't necessarily the best based on need or the most, most cost effective. Uh, this would include services like flex route services or feeder services. Uh, the opportunity to contract with other shared ride operators like Lyft and Uber uh, to provide service during uh, low demand times, or the use of voucher programs that would give persons uh, better access to transit. Um, so uh, those are some of the tools that can be used uh, uh, with alternative service. And part of what uh, we're charged with doing this spring is trying to identify based on community need and the operating characteristics of the system where some of those flex services might be best deployed. Uh, in uh, April, we're holding uh, a transportation symposium uh, in which we're inviting uh, stakeholders to spend a day with us and a facilitator learning about uh, alternative transportation services, the tools, how they can be used, and then also discussing community needs. At the end of that symposium, we'll take the data and develop a service option plan that we'll present to the city that'll talk about opportunities for us to start introducing alternative services. And they're gonna be done to two, one of two things. Either we'll identify areas in the system that aren't very productive and reintroduce or replace them with some kind of a more flexible service or we might, looking at, might look at areas where there's a special need and it doesn't make sense to run a big bus, then we would start to introduce some of these other programs. Uh, so the, the plan is that we would identify, have some kind of a, a list of options that we can start considering implementing in the fall of 17, so that uh, in August we ramp up the system to where uh, we've got a good solid base, and then in the fall of 17, we start adding these other services to uh, bring added value. Uh, throughout the process, then, uh, we'll be monitoring performance, and where there's need, we, c we hope that what we'll find is that these services become interchangeable. Where a fixed route might not be providing the kind of service we want, maybe we can start to augment or improve that service with some of these alternative services. And then uh, we will be following up the council on an annual basis on how these services are operating and progressing. And we'll keep you up to speed too. Uh, the second uh, thing I want to talk to you about is our uh, Q line. Uh, most of you know the Q line is a route that operates in, in uh, downtown Wichita. It's operated for a number of years. We've been involved with the uh, downtown community talking about how we can improve that service. Um, and after a couple years of study uh, of the service, getting input from stakeholders and taking a look at other successful operations, we've recommended some pretty significant changes in the queue line. Uh, the improvements are include uh, making the routes more linear. Today, we've got a very circuitous route that's gonna provide faster, more direct service. It'll include, instead of one route, it'll actually have four routes, two that operate weekday evenings and Saturdays, and then two other routes that actually operate during the lunch hour. Service will be uh, high frequency. The current service operates about every 20 minutes. The service that we're implementing will operate uh, about every 10 minutes on these routes. So it'll be the kind of thing where you walk to the corner. If the bus just went by, there'll be one another couple stoplights up, so there won't be much of a wait. Uh, the service is going to be greatly expanded. 
part of the concept is rather than just serve visitors to the community who are in staying in hotels here for an event, we want to connect the, the neighborhoods in the community and connect the, the, the ring, the outer ring around the central business district with what's going on in the CBD. So uh, as you'll see in a minute, the routes connect Delano, Douglas Design District, and College Hill area uh, with, with downtown. We'll also have greatly expanded hours. We'll operate um, earlier service on Saturdays, actually starting at 8 o'clock in the morning, and operate later at night on weekends, actually until 1 o'clock in the morning. So uh, it's, it's going to be a lot of service. And then the service will be rebranded and introduced. We'll have better marketing information, uh, better mark stops. And again, we'll serve multiple markets, not only the visitors of the community, but it's also something that residents of the community who want to come down and just explore downtown or come down to an event will be able to take advantage of. Uh, we have a, a May 6th um, kickoff date planned. Uh, this uh, graphic shows the uh, weekday evening and Saturday routes. Uh, the blue route, um, we call the Old Town route, will serve the hotels on Main and Market and connect them via Douglas uh, to uh, Old Town. The uh, orange route uh, will really be the heart and soul of the queue line, which is going to be operating on Douglas, connecting uh, Delano and Lawrence Dumont uh, with Douglas in Trust Arena, Old Town, Douglas Design District, as well as uh, Clifton Square uh, and College Hill. Uh, Monday through Thursday, the service will operate between um, Hydraulic on the east and Delano on the west. Uh, on the weekends, Friday nights and Saturdays, the service will be ex actually extended to Clifton Square. And it's interesting, we just met with the Clifton Square, or the uh, Douglas Design Group board today. They're interested in seeing if they can come up with matching funds to get it extended as far as Oliver. Um, uh, I don't think Mike's wine dive wants to be left out of the uh, party here. So. Um, so we're really excited. There are a lot of people excited about this. The other interesting thing is that this is a public-private partnership. The business community has raised 20% uh, of the operating costs for this service. Uh, so uh, they really do have some skin in the game. Uh, this graphic shows the lunch hour routes uh, that would operate uh, Monday through Friday from 11 to 1.30. Service on, on the yellow route that connects Delano via Douglas to Old Town would be operating about every eight minutes. Uh, and then the government center route, which is the red route, uh, connecting City Hall, uh, the county offices, and the Epic Center with, with Old Town would operate about every 10 minutes during, during those hours. And again, that's operating Monday through Friday. So uh, we're kicking this service off. Uh, 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 on uh, May 6th, uh, we know we've got uh, the commitment, financial commitments uh, to operate it for the next year. Uh, it'll be heavily promoted, and by the way, the, the fare is free. So what we're hoping to demonstrate when you take a look at uh, Douglas Avenue is uh, we'll have buses operating every 20 minutes along that, or every 10 minutes along that street. And we think you get into an area that's got denser population with a lot of activities going on, uh, that we can stimulate a lot of activity. One of the nice things about the queue line is if we can get somebody to take a ride on the trolley, say to go to an event, to go out on a Friday night, they understand that public transit works, and this also becomes an introduction for people uh, to see that they could actually use the transit system to get to and from work on a daily basis. So those are some of the uh, we think long-term goals uh, and advantages of operating the service. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? I think that, uh, as we talked before, that, that line that goes down Douglas from Delano all the way into to, uh, East Wichita, basically, is going to be significant. And it's going to go till 1 in the morning on one Friday in the morning. Saturday night. Yeah, it's past my bedtime, but I understand there are 20-somethings that are out Yes, yes. Janet will be out there. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> <You bet. clears throat> Executive Committee, we did not meet. Do you have any update, Dan? No. Okay. 
We did not meet this month, but we do need to this month. Okay. And then uh, attack report, Tom. One thing I got to report today is that we set up several months ago a task team to look at residual funds at the end of the year. Uh, a lot of times we don't know what the dollars are going to be until six weeks or so before we have to spend them. It's not enough time to have a long project that needs to go through KDOT uh, to get put in place. So uh, I met with Kristen and Jason yesterday. They kind of gave me a high level briefing on where they're at with that task team. And Kristen's going to talk to the whole group today about it. So. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Yeah, I'm glad to just uh, give a, a brief update on, on uh, the status of this committee. I do want to let you know, uh, Jason and I will be back next month for a more involved, uh, more in-depth presentation for you. But uh, we're definitely glad to give a quick update uh, today. So uh, yeah, like Tom mentioned, uh, your TAC, your t uh, Transportation Advisory Committee has been uh, working on a plan to address this administrative issue we've been we've been faced with. Uh, and that's to do with our uh, WAMPO's project funding programs. And uh, what's been happening is oftentimes at the end of the federal fiscal year, uh, we've had a balance. Um, for the last three years, that amount has ranged from about $400,000 to a million dollars. Uh, there's been, um, but we really cannot be certain about the exact amount until about uh, right at the end of the fiscal year. So it's really important that we have a plan in place to make smart use of this funding. Uh, otherwise, we, we risk losing it. Uh, keep in mind, this is sort of the, the, the funding left over at the end of the year. And it represents uh, just, just about 1% of WAMPO's total sub-allocated funding, which is uh, about $12 million a year. So like Tom mentioned, uh, really, the main constraint we're faced with is this money cannot be used on new capital construction projects, which would be our first uh, first line of thinking for how to use it. Uh, the, the project development process takes about uh, 33 months to get through, and we really only have six to eight weeks. So uh, traditionally, what we've done is to sort of move forward promised reimbursements to projects that were, were promised uh, payments in future years. We move those reimbursements forward. Uh, that's been working pretty well, uh, with the exception that it, there sometimes just isn't enough uh, scheduled reimbursements to absorb all that money. Uh, so um, what, as, a, as a way to sort of supplement and address this, uh, what we've come up with is a, a really small uh, pilot program that would make these funds available for uh, planning activities for all of our member governments, all of our uh, city and county governments that are members of WAMPO. Uh, these uh, non-capital, non-construction activities would be ready in time to use this money and, of course, don't require uh, this involved uh, multi-year project development process. So we did ask that a small subcommittee uh, of your TAC be put together to help us refine this recommendation and to make sure it's fair to all of our member governments and make sure it represents their interests. Uh, this group has met three times so far, and uh, they have one more meeting scheduled here in a couple weeks. And <clears throat> so they've made some really good headway. I'm really happy to report we've uh, had some really productive meetings and uh, feel really positive about, uh, about what's been done so far. We do expect, uh, since we don't really have a good, good strong handle on the demand for these sorts of projects, we expect we need to have kind of a plan B in place. And so in the event that this small pilot program doesn't absorb all of the balance at the end of the year, we expect uh, we presented several options to this uh, team to look at. And uh, sort of where we're at is ranking them in terms of their fairness to the member jurisdictions, uh, the difficulty to administer them, and the quality of the process. And really where we ended up with that discussion is that we'll just continue to do what we've been doing, and that's to, uh, to, to move forward these promised reimbursements. Uh, so again, this is all still a work in progress. We'll, we'll be here. Uh, next month for a, a more involved update. Uh, we just wanted to keep you in the loop on this. And we also wanted to let you know, you know, regardless of whatever uh, does come out of this process, we can guarantee that no funds will be taken away from existing projects and um, that, this, that this, this program is really only focused on the money, uh, the, any, any positive balance at the end of the year. 
So again, uh, we'll be back next month for a more involved update, and we'll be uh, asking uh, the TAC to make a recommendation in April, and we'll be back in May for uh, asking you to take action on it. I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have or sit tight till next month. Kind of, Tom, feel free. Trying to give them an idea of what kind of projects you're looking at or the team's looking Sorry, at. Sorry, what's that? What I, types, I couldn't quite hear you. What types of projects you're looking at might be candidates? Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. So uh, an idea. these would be sort of what we call non-capital, non-construction planning projects. Um, these would be things that could uh, help your jurisdiction carry out a plan. So it would be involving uh, public involvement. Uh, you might do some sort of uh, survey of your citizens, of your constituents. Um, we, they would be uh, contracted out to a consultant to car carry this out. So. Uh, survey. Uh, they would uh, evaluate the uh, sort of a geographic area you're interested in in developing, like maybe a corridor or a downtown or a traditional area, or a, a historic area of your town, um, and come up with some recommendations for some capital construction projects that could be done in the in the future. Okay. Yep. Yeah, Troy, ask a question. Um, have you brought up asset management as a possible use of this? Because quite honestly, to implement asset management the way we need is going to probably cost in the million dollar range. So I really feel like that should be on the agenda for that. Yeah, that that did come up. Thanks for thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, that did come up several times with our subcommittee and also other folks we've talked to about this. And I think kind of at least where we're at now is you know we we know that that's already got about five hundred thousand dollars in the tip for 2019 uh, with some of our suballocated money. So I think the thinking is. What you had mentioned 400,000 to a million a year is what you seem to be, or what we seem to be. That's what we've had in the last with. three years. Um, so one of the, uh, the challenges that we're having right now is trying to figure out how to pay for um, a full-time staff person. Is this something that's not, that money is not able to be allocated to or? We should, we should probably talk offline afterwards about that a little bit. There, there is some, uh, definitely some constraints with using this money in terms of, of uh, making sure it has to be used in this short amount of time. And so that's why this sort of capital construction work is off. But if this is, um, I'm, gl I'm glad to talk, talk with you afterwards and we can see if that's something, something that's possible. Oh, yeah, I think it would be nice. To <laughs> uh, I, I know, I We'll have to check on some of the federal requirements. I'm not 100% for sure we can we can use it for staff time. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Troy. Any other questions? Thank you, Kristen. Like Kristen said this will be coming back next month on the agenda as an agenda item. Okay. So it was just kind of to give everybody a little bit of a heads up today. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any other business? Any news? Any announcements? Being none, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you for coming. <laughs>